Well, hello, Cove Church. So great to be with you today as we continue our series called Treasure. Today, talking about the truth that God treasures unity. Psalm 133, verse 1 says this, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. I think we would all agree with that. It truly is good and pleasant when people live together in unity, but I would add that that is often also short-lived and rare to see God's people live in unity. We do not default to unity. We default as people, as human beings, to disunity. We see this established from the first moment of blame in the Garden of Eden where Adam's saying, you know, the woman you put here with me, she's, she's the one that gave me the fruit. And of course I ate it because I eat everything. So that's what I do. And so from the very beginning, the outflow of sin was to blame, was to divide. And we have been dividing ever since. We divide over Gender, we divide over ethnicity, we divide over social strata, we divide over political ideology. Creating and perpetuating prejudice of every kind. We even divide over the most trivial things. Which way is the toilet paper supposed to go in the holster? Over or under? You tell me. Which Rocky movie was the best? In fact, it's a tie for one and four, just in case you're wondering. But that's, you know, we divide over which Rocky movie is the best one. All of you remember Team Edward, Team Jacob? We divide. We find new ways to divide. Tropicana just came out with a cereal that is designed to be used not with milk, but with orange juice. Huh. So now we have this great division that will be created because we'll have the milk people on cereal and the orange juice people on cereal, yet another division in play. We divide over tea or coffee, meat eater or vegetarian, those who eat kale and those who eat things that taste good. We divide over all of those things. Divide, 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 sometimes over trivial things, sometimes over essential things, where the harms of those divides become prejudice that leads to lasting damage to hearts and minds of God's beloved people. In fact, I would argue that among the most devastating consequences of sin in this world is the prevalence of division, of disunity, of prejudice. And sadly, our disunity has only grown in proportion to our population. Yet, that in no way diminishes God's heart or unity. It does, however, make us realize how much we need God to achieve true unity. There is this work that God invites us to, a work that is not completed in a moment. Instead, it is a work we must intentionally choose every day. It is the work to address this sinister and destructive expression of disunity in our lives. And it must be addressed for this reason. Human brokenness is expressed in a desire to divide, while God's wholeness is expressed in an invitation to be one. And the difficulty of honestly addressing those false divisions is that we can all have blind spots, can't we? Our cultural lenses that can cloud our view, we can have our prejudices and they can come in so many different forms. You know, we joke with my wife, Paula, that she has the perfect villain backstory. She was born on the day Dr. King was assassinated. She was raised uh, in funeral homes and she was trained as a clown. She's the perfect villain backstory. She would be a super villain. I'm thankful that she uses her powers for good now, but she would be an amazing super villain. She has the perfect backstory. But as part of um, being raised in a mortician's home, they would live at the funeral home. And there was a season in middle school where they were living at the funeral home and she would catch the bus right there at the cemetery. Well, people on the bus, the kids on the bus noticed that. Here's the girl that catches the bus in the cemetery, the girl that lives in the cemetery. And they didn't take kindly to that. 
In fact, every day she would get on the bus and all the kids would scoot to the middle of the aisle to make sure she didn't have a place to sit. They saw her as something other, something, something not like them. And so they made sure that she didn't have a place. She was forced to just find the edge of somebody's seat while they looked the other way in order to have a place. And I, I so wish I could have been there in those days. I would have sat with her. Oh, I would have loved sitting with her. They were really missing out. She was different. And because she was different, her difference was not seen as good. Sadly, this is what people, human beings, tend to do with differences. The great tragedy of the human condition is that uniqueness is not celebrated, it's punished. Differences are seen as weaknesses, not a benefit. Yet it is in that uniqueness that we actually express God's call, God's plan, God's design, how specific it is to us. We, as God's people, get to celebrate that, to see God's beauty in that diversity, or at least we should. Yet the indicting thing is out of all the places in the world where prejudice and disunity should never have a foothold or an expression or a possible voice. Of all the places, it should be God's church. Yet it has been said that 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings is still the most racially divided hour in America. So what do we do about that kind of disunity? Well, here's what I'm hoping for. Here's what I'm believing God for, is to give each of us a path towards unity that only God can create because God treasures unity. That is where we go in our treasure series today. We're going to gain a biblical understanding of unity, a kingdom of God worldview when it comes to unity. Because division started when the enemy opened his mouth and it ends when we seek Jesus to close it. So let's do that together. How does that happen? Here's the first thing. Unity is born out of higher thinking. Unity is born out of higher thinking. We're going to be in the book of Colossians. Starting verse, uh, or chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Let's read it together. Big voices go. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Seek the things that are above. So God invites us to live for ways that are higher. That as a Christ follower, I don't have to just yield to my natural way, to my culture's way. I can actually walk in God's ways, which means in Christ, we become ambassadors of a better way, a higher way, a way that is often foreign to our world. And that way, it will take us some time to understand. It's a way that ultimately must be seen on this earth. But it takes a while for us to see that way. I'm reminded of a favorite story of mine when uh, the boys were little and Ethan was going to school for the first time. Uh, it was kindergarten, I think, maybe half day. And so, um, you know, before school, Isaac and Ethan are playing and that sort of thing. And, and uh, we load everybody in the car first day of school, you know, and Ethan goes and he's got his little backpack on and, and, uh, we, we, we go and we take him to the school and then we say, bye, Ethan. We're all waving, you know, Isaac's waving, bye, Ethan. You know, away he goes to class. Goes to class, you know, we're crying, you know, it's the first day of school or parents. It's a big moment. Well, I, I go to work and um, Paul is home with Isaac that day and Isaac's just playing throughout the day and, and, and doing things and, and uh, the day goes by and it comes time to go and pick Ethan up. Paula says to Isaac, okay, Isaac, it's, it's time for us to load up in the van. We're going to go get your brother. And Isaac looks up from his toys and says, you mean he's coming back? <laughs> All he had known up to that moment was one way. If you leave, you're, you're gone. But that understanding had to change. Oh, he can, he can come back. There was a process that moved him beyond his initial experience. 
this is our role as Christ followers regarding all of the prejudices that want to create a disunity in us, that we're engaged in a higher thinking. We're inviting each other to a better way that we get to provide hope in a very divided world. Telling people, you know, life, it doesn't have to be like this. If, if you're not sure about that, just look at this promise from the book of Galatians. Galatians 3, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We see here this truth. If I have relationship with Jesus, I can't treat you differently because of your background or your ethnicity or your circumstance because Jesus has made us one. And it certainly reveals to us how far from God's heart is prejudice of any kind because prejudice attempts to tatter what God treasures. Prejudice builds walls where Jesus builds bridges. Prejudice creates disunity where God creates unity. That's why we have to think differently. To recognize that God calls us to a higher way, a higher view. And for that to happen, we must admit that there are ways that I think that do not reflect how God thinks. And so we get to trade our lower ways of thinking for God's higher ways of thinking. How do we do that? Well, here's how. What we do is I put my truth next to God's truth and I let God's truth win. I put my experience and my truth next to God's truth and I let God's truth win. When God says here, there's no great Greek or Jew, no slave or free, no caste system, no division. That's the truth that must win. This is what we do as we grow up. We mature and we think higher thoughts. It's like I can remember being a kid and my mom uh, telling me, I remember asking where thunder came from. And she told me it's the sound that's made when clouds bump together. I carried that for a while until I went to school. And then we, the teacher at one point was talking about thunder and asked the class where thunder came from, which of course I knew the answer. It's where, you know, clouds bump together. It didn't fly in my class, didn't fly with my teacher. Got me, it made me look a little bit like I didn't know what was going on. I had to trade my thinking, which I now know the truth. It's angels burping. I get it. I, I know what happened. But I had to trade my thinking. I had to learn something new. I had to trade lower thinking for higher thinking, trading the untrue for the true. That is what we must continue to do if we are to experience unity, to allow Jesus to transform our thinking about everything and especially about people. Unity is born out of higher thinking. That's the first thing. Here's the second. Unity is born out of honest change. Colossians chapter 3, continuing the passage. Let's read it. Big voices go. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Here we see that concept once again that in Christ we are one. And the passage points us to some things, especially that speak to how we create our own disunity. The, it's the stereotypes that we engage in, the, the prejudices. Maybe these are the things that, that each of us gets to learn to put away, uh, to tear out from our lives, to remove 
from our way of walking around this world. They're patterns. Perhaps it's from the way we were raised. Assumptions that we've never confronted. Uh, here's an example. Growing up in Redmond, I was raised, and I heard this often, that Californians were bad. Californians are evil, right? Because they're coming up into our town with all their money, and they got their sunglasses, and they got their almond milk. Man, Californians are bad. That was just the message all the time. They were like, man, we don't need any 90210 in the 97756. They are like, we ain't doing that. Californians are bad. That was the message. And I had to learn over time that Californians aren't bad. And I actually enjoy almond milk as well. So there. They're not bad. I had to learn to think differently. I had to change. Each of us have to take an honest look at our ways of communicating that divide us instead of unite us. And we have to be willing to put those ways away. It mentions anger and wrath and malice and slander, obscene talk. These are some of the weapons of disunity, expressions that separate and alienate, and they are not to be our weapons, not ever. You say, well, what if they ask for it? No, put them away. Yeah, but sometimes you just got to throw down, right? No, no, we're told put them away. And it would seem that this is ours to do. You know, there was that show that used to be on, I don't know if it's on anymore, called Hoarders, and uh, where people would, their houses would be filled with stuff and, and they're hoarding stuff. And so the experts would say that the, the people that own those houses, they must be involved in the removal <coughs> of that stuff. Because if they're not involved with the removal, if they just bring in a crew and empty out their house, when those folks move back into the house, they'll just start to hoard again. It will just happen all over. There has to be a change in them. They have to be a part of the process. They have to do it themselves. There has to be a transformation that takes place in them. There is, friends, some work that all of us must be willing to personally do regarding unity. We must address how honestly we actually feel, how we, how we honestly speak when it comes to those that we may see as different than us. And we must ask ourselves some hard questions. Questions about our background. Some of us come from families where the way that certain people groups were spoken of was toxic, it was slander, it was malice. And Christ invites us to put that away. Some of us came from families where prejudice was never spoken of at all. And in that void, fear and uncertainty and myth took root. These are also to be put away by us taken off of the table, and no one can do it but us. Remember, what we speak matters. We're told in Proverbs 18 that life and death is found in the power of the tongue, meaning our words either add value or remove it, add life or take it away. It's, it's like this, um, you know, I, I, we love, Paul and I love shopping at Grocery Outlet. It's always a favorite. And I, I can remember shopping there as a kid and having this experience. Um, because a Grocery Outlet, if you go to the toy section, um, especially back then, I'm not so sure now, but back then, if you went to the toy section, that's where they would take all the mislabeled kind of misfit toys would end up there at grocery outlet. It would be like the misprinted things. It would be like the defect things. It'd be like a, a Godzilla with a Kim Kardashian head. That kind of stuff would end up there for sale at grocery outlet. And I remember being there as a kid looking through the toy section and I found this David Hasselhoff toy, you know, action figure toy from Baywatch, you know, David Hasselhoff. And, uh, and you could see printed on the box itself was $12.99 was the price of it. But Grocery Outlet had put a sticker right next to it, green sticker, said 2.99. dollars 
It was obvious that it started out at that value, 1299, but now it had been devalued to 299 somehow in that process. That is a picture of what the enemy wants to do with all people. Take us from the value that we started with and diminish us. And this is what disunity and prejudice creates. This is what it breeds. It takes what God had, has originally assigned a high value to, and over time, it takes and puts its own sticker on the box, making it less. Now you say, why is that a problem? Well, here's why. Because Jesus establishes our value by purchasing us on the cross which means the life of every human being you encounter is worthy of the blood of God's Son. To deny that value is to undermine the sacrifice of Christ. We're told in this passage that at the feet of Jesus, there is no Greek, no Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, no barbarian, no Scythian, no slave, no, no free person, but Christ is all and in all. We are one in him, meaning we are to celebrate our differences, not fear them. And we must do that because in Christ, we are one. As Christ reconciles us to himself, we become reconciled to one another. The cross of Christ makes it possible that all people, regardless of race or creed or culture or tribe, that all people can know Jesus to be one in him. And that becomes the message we proclaim, that unity is then born out of honest change. Lastly, unity is born out of understanding. Colossians 3, the passage goes on. Let's read it together. Big voices go. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive so we've talked about some things that we need to put away, but now we see there's some things we need to put on. This requires an intentionality on our part that we would put on compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. All of it creating something that the world desperately needs, empathy. One of the things for my life that I've determined to do is to intentionally place myself in, envir in environments where I am the minority, either in, in race or history or culture. And I know that in doing so, I, I make myself a bit uncomfortable, but I also know that's the only way I can grow. That's the only way I can move from kind of enigma to empathy, to understand more, to listen more, to see more. This is the work we all get to do. See, I, I think we would agree that many important things changed with the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But I think we could also all attest to the fact that we're not fixed. That prejudice continues to be a cancer in our world. Why? Here's why. Politics doesn't change hearts. Jesus does. Politics doesn't change hearts. Jesus does. Which means as Christ followers, we go first. We change first. We get uncomfortable first. We listen first. Because until my heart for another changes, I'll never see another's heart change towards me. This is part of the miracle of God's redemption. See, humanity as a whole, it continues to struggle because we can't possibly imagine that someone else and their experience is different than ours. It's like, how is that possible? So, so what do we do with understanding that's how we approach life? Well, let me offer this to you. And I've taught on this before, but I think it's a key to this conversation. I think the smallest passage in the New Testament is a huge key 
to defeating prejudice in our world. It's John 11:35. 35, Jesus wept. The context, if you recall, is that Jesus' friend Lazarus was sick. His friends invited him to come, Jesus to come and pray for him. Jesus delayed, so Lazarus dies. And when he finally gets there, his friends said, Jesus, if you would have come before, Lazarus would have lived. And when Jesus saw them weeping, we're told he was deeply moved. And he goes to where they laid the body and we're told that Jesus wept. Here's why that is significant for us. Jesus wasn't weeping for himself. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew that this day was going to end in rejoicing, in celebration. He knew that Lazarus would rise from the dead. Jesus knew there was nothing to be sad about. That was not the experience that he was having, but they were having that experience. So why weep? Jesus was weeping because he saw the world from the eyes of those who were grieving, those who were hurting, those who could not see the same way he could see, those who were experiencing the world differently than he was. And Jesus was able to share with them their pain, their grief, their concern their frustration, not his experience, not his understanding, their experience, their understanding. So knowing that about that passage, if you're not yet a Christ follower, include this in the great reasons to become one. And here it is. When we walk with Jesus, he gives us the ability to see life from someone else's perspective. To have genuine empathy to know that although I have not experienced what you are experiencing, I can listen, I can understand, I can have compassion and kindness, I can put that on. This understanding, it unravels prejudice and it creates unity. And at times, I think for us, the line can be, well, aren't we kind of done with all this stuff, you know? Aren't we past all this? Haven't, haven't we evolved past all this? Can't we move on from talk of race and reconciliation and disunity? Here's what genuine empathy says to that. It says, I will stop talking about prejudice and disunity when my brothers and sisters of color say we can stop talking about it. That's when I'll stop talking about it. Until that time, it's up to each of us to listen and to understand that I can, to some degree, some small degree, attempt to see through another's eyes, to feel something that another feels. And Jesus makes that possible. <laughs> That's the great miracle. What an amazing outflow of walking with Jesus. Can you imagine how different the world would be if people actually did this? Suddenly the world is not made up of us and them. It's just us. So we put on compassion and kindness and humility and patience, and we tie it all up with this thing called forgiveness. Because I realize that my brother and my sister need those things just as much as I do. And those things, they allow me to walk in the shoes of another at least a little bit. And that can change me because unity is born out of understanding. I'll wrap up with this. I saw a picture of this. Um, it was in our Good Friday service. And I, I just love how Jesus does this. There, there's a lot of things that we plan and, and kind of prepare for, but there's a lot, a lot of times that Jesus does, does something different with it than you ever imagined. But because of the way the Good Friday service was set up on the stage, there was a cross in the center, nothing else on the stage. The, the, the team and, and musicians and singers were off to the side and they had placed one table of communion right at the foot of the cross on the floor. Normally we would have a couple of tables. Oftentimes we do communion. It's up there. We don't pass the plate. It's up, up there by your chairs. But because it was Good Friday, we, we made it possible that people would come down and get communion. 
And so, and Pastor Janelle had, had made home, home-baked bread for communion. So, so they said, when we're ready to do communion, the team said, just come on down to the floor, to the table, and, and you can break the bread and stand behind the table as people come and get communion. I said, that sounds like a, a great idea. So the service was going. I did that. I came down, broke the bread, talking about communion. And then I, I, I was just left to stand behind the table as people came forward to take communion. And that's when I saw it. I saw all these people at our church and, and I saw people, uh, men and women, I saw people of, of different ethnicities, so many different stories. Some of them I knew, some I didn't. Yet each of them found their way to the foot of the cross to receive the bread of life that comes from Jesus. So much diversity in that expression. It was just like, here they are. We're all so different, so many different backgrounds. Yet here, we are united. And I remember saying in the moment, this, the cross is the great equalizer of humanity. Here is what this place is supposed to be. That every person of every tribe and nation and tongue can come and find their way to Jesus and make their way to the table, that all of us, as we often say, are just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And I saw it on that Friday. Here's what it can look like. That is the message of Jesus. That is the message of unity that Jesus offers to us, a unity that is not found in common experience, but rather in common need. We all need Jesus together. And as we get close to him, we are automatically close to one another. That's what it does. We think unity is about this shared understanding, but it's ultimately about a shared friend. As I'm close to Jesus, I'm going to be closer to you. Revelation 7, 9 and 10 says this, After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in loud voices, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That is a picture of what heaven looks like. And so our work as a church is not done until the demographics of our church matches the demographics of heaven. A place where every nation, tongue and tribe worships Jesus together as one. Together we come and point to him. And this work does not happen in theory. It does not happen in think tanks. It does not happen in debate. No, it takes place on the ground. It takes place in this church. This is where we practice. And this is where we grow. And together with Jesus, we can grow into a people who experience what it is to truly be one in Him. A people who discover firsthand that God treasures unity. Let's pray.